One day last spring, Lieutenant Wesley J. Butch McGorkle ran into some unusual flying conditions. Should he bail out? What to do? Meanwhile, of course, McGorkle was rapidly losing altitude. The situation presented but one opportunity, bailing out. Why did he hesitate? Fear of using the parachute dates back five centuries. Ever since its invention by the artist Leonardo da Vinci, men have shown a reluctance to employ the device. Oh, no, senor! Tu no mi tremore che sarei la via sopria che la macchina! English translation? I quit! Falling through space is one of the basic fears of mankind. Like many other flyers in this crisis, McGorkle delayed acting. He tried to escape his fear by hiding in the false security of his cockpit. Until the grim reality became alarming. He had to bail out. In a parachute? Suspicion of the parachute began with the first successful descent. July 3rd, 1785, in France. <laughs> the great pioneer balloonist, Jean-Pierre Blanchard, passed the honor to his intrepid associate. Unlike fearless Alphonse, our man McGorkle was timid about hitting the silk. He was afraid of getting hurt. Afraid it wouldn't open. And afraid of landing. Said McGorkle to McGorkle, perish the thought before it perishes you. And then he remembered. For the Navy pilot who jumped correctly from a high enough altitude, a parachute has never failed to open. When he checked it out, McGorkle knew he could trust that chute to open. His guarantee was the packing data card, proving that the parachute had been inspected and freshly packed. All he had to do was check that the pins were in place and were safety tied. 
Of course, McGorkle knew he had to wear his chute and harness exactly as prescribed. Properly fastened and snugged up tight. Otherwise, like for instance with loose straps, things could happen, such as throwing undue strains on the body. But McGorkle had followed regulations. And now he recovered his confidence just in the nick of time, which was high time to get out while the getting is good. After all, he was not on a picnic. McGorkle followed the recommended procedure. First, he did his best to slow the plane down. Then he opened his canopy and began to disconnect his radio cord and his oxygen gear. He would have plugged in his bailout oxygen bottle if he'd been on oxygen. Last of all, he opened his safety belt and threw back his shoulder straps where they could not tangle with his parachute harness. Then he put his goggles down, even though he knew he'd probably lose them first thing, and turned to face his chosen side of exit, taking care to stay down out of the slipstream, and remembering that if he put his foot on the edge of the cockpit, his spring would raise him too high into the slipstream. This wasn't going to happen to McGorkle because of his ground training, where he had learned the right technique. He placed his hands on the side of the plane, ready to pull himself out. At the same time, shoving with his feet, powerful, fast, and low, and going straight out and down. This way, clearly missing the tail surfaces. Seven, eight, nine, nine and a half, ten, and eleven, and twelve, and until he was well clear of the plane and below freezing anoxic altitudes when he laid eyes on that ripcord grip, took hold, and pulled. With his harness snugged up tight, he took the opening shock. Easy. There was just one more little problem. Landing. Fortunately, McGorkle had plenty of experience as a boy jumping off the old woodshed. Where the force of landing was equal to that of hitting the ground in a parachute. He had learned to come down lightly. Relax. Now, McGorkle faced the direction of his drift, preparing to land on land. Had it been a water landing, he would have released his harness as soon as his feet were wet. But McGorkle landed on good old real estate, lightly, nimbly, completely relaxed. He didn't have the trouble this lass had with her umbrella in the strong March wind. He could collapse his chute by pulling on the lower risers. Well done, McGorkle. Nothing, really. 